Hello friends, welcome to this History News Live and I'm very glad to have made it on Monday. I wasn't sure if we we're going to have to postpone it to tomorrow uh, but all the things that could have happened today fell into a very neat, timely order and thus I was able to schedule this to go um, up at our usual time which is of course half past eight. Let's say some hellos. This is from last week. Uh, hello, Shannon, again. Welcome. Welcome for and thank you for coming back. Love to see you. Um, thank you, homebody. Glad that you are looking forward to it. And thank you for pre liking the stream. We have Diana from Chicago, 30 degrees and cloudy. Christine from Malta, hello. Elaine of Shalott. Hello from Massachusetts, expecting ice tonight. Fingers crossed that you keep power. All oh, this has just been a huge jump. Hello from Canada, Washington. Good evening. Hello. Lovely to see familiar faces. LA, uh, 65 degrees or 18 degrees and sunny. Lovely. Hello, Gracie. Hello, Shane. Some... Um, I need to check my eyes. They are shamrocks. Wow, I need to see a <laughs> optician. Um, hello from the thumb of Michigan. Well, welcome. <laughs> hope it's nice in the in the thumb. <laughs> uh, Jared's drink is ready. I do hope we aren't. We have remembered the rule, friends. I'm going to say it right now. The rule is this is not a drinking game. At no point, at no point tonight should anything be a drinking game. I, I cannot take responsibility for your livers in such a way. Vanessa in from Australia. Australia. I thought it was Austria. Australia. I'm trying to work out the time difference. I it's either very late or very early. Welcome. Thank you. Uh I'll give you a weather report because you're too late to look out the window. Any hints on the next video? Well, this month is Women's International Women's History Month. That was a lot of hard words for me to say. So it's related to that. And from New Mexico, hello, Nottingham, DC, hello. Welcome, friends. We have, oh, it's just, just had a big jump, just had a massive jump. Um, hello from Germany, Seattle. And we have from Felton in Delaware. If I missed you, it's because the comments are hoppity scoppity jumping. It's lovely to see you here. 73 of you by my count. Welcome. I have an enormous amount of news stories to cover. It has, as, you, as you're about to see when I put up my thanks slide, you are going to see that so many people have very kindly taken the time to send me all sorts of news items. So you will imagine, I'm sure, we have an awful lot to cover so I am going to be motoring through. As always we have all of the articles linked in the description box. I will I have numbered the slides and so they will the number on the slide will correspond with the number next to the news link in the description box. I've also linked an opera pin board with all of the news and on that you will see who sent me what and who I'm grateful to for doing so. If you are joining us live, it's so lovely to have you here. I'm incredibly grateful. If you are watching on the playback, thank you ever so much. I hope you're going to enjoy this time with us. So let us, without further ado, hello, everybody. Lovely to see you all coming in. Um, let us, without further ado, get the first set of stream up. And this is the thank you list. So I need to say thank you. I'm going to have to put that up full because my face in the way of the lower bits. Um, I have to say thank you to Sherry, Sarah, Carol, Anne, Jesse, Yvonne, Carolyn, Verity, Carve Phelan, Mary, Beth, Jesse, Louise, Kenny, Joseph, Crazy Artist Lady, and to Noah. As always, I'm always inc so incredibly grateful 
take the time out of their day to spot a news headline, think of me, and then take the time to send it over. So thank you all for taking that time. As per, we have some updates, some repatriation stories, some new news, and some events and exhibitions. Um, the And Dorothy has said, I hope we're going to have a uh, highly anticipated news segment. Well, here's the thing. We do have some genital related news, but they so clearly split. Oh, that sounds vile. The stories that are connected don't logically fit into one section. Maybe they will in future, but rest assured, we have both an update and an event that is phallus related. <laughs> so let's go, shall we? <laughs> let's carry on. Um, in the update, this is from last week where we have the story about the skeleton found in the Thames wearing thigh-high leather boots. We have some updates on what that actually looked like. We've got a durable pair of boots that were found. This skeleton dates back around 500 years. He's been found face down in the mud in the River Thames. He was wearing thigh-high leather footwear that remained virtually intact. The find is made in Bermondsey in South London, and it's made by archaeologists working on London's new, quote, super sewer, Bazalgette is being, they're coming for his gig. This is a £4.2 billion tunnel that will capture, store and transfer raw sewage and rainwater that currently overflows into the river. There are parts of the river that are clean. Clearly, past Bermondsey <laughs> is not the one currently. Um, as it rightly points out, leather was an expensive commodity in Tudor times, so it's unlikely that somebody would be buried wearing such a highly prized item. As with so many things, uh, expensive clothing is passed on, it's given to servants, it's left in wills. So the thought is that this is somebody who, who drowned, who died by accident. He may have been a fisherman, a mudlark, or perhaps a sailor. By studying the boots, they have been able to Gain a quote fascinating glimpse into the daily life of a man who lived as much as 500 years ago. They have helped us to better understand how he made his living in hazardous and difficult conditions, but also how he may have died. It's been a privilege to be able to study something that is so rare and so personal. The, built, the boots were built with extra soles and stuffed with moss or a similar material to help them last in tough terrain. This is according to the film the firm's conservation experts crazy artist lady has put up the question could it have been a moida i mean they haven't found anything they haven't stated that they have found anything necessarily on the bones that would point to that what they have said is that he's likely to have died under the age of 35 and that he had deep deep grooves in his teeth by caused by a repetitive action like passing a rope between his teeth as a fisherman might um, you say that uh, that it feel, being fa found face down in the mud in the Thames suggests not being intentionally put there it's worth remembering that the Thames is a tidal river and people in this period certainly were dumping bodies in the Thames that may well have been found face down in fact that's what did for the river pirate Alice Wolfe also known as Alice Tankerville she dumped two bodies that she'd murdered on a boat with her husband common law uh, and then they they washed up because bodies float uh homebody suggests he could have been drunk and drowned absolutely equally the thames is being used by numerous boats it is a tidal river in in high winds and all of that sort of stuff it you could it can get quite rough if you're working at night if you're traveling at night on, in that Way, it's easy to have an accident. Also, if you go down to the Thames foreshore at one time and then you get stuck by the tide, you, you can get into a sticky wicket quite quickly, which is one of the reasons why I say people who are desirous of going mudlarking, it's really important that you know the river and that you also um, pre preferably go with somebody who knows what they're doing to show you the way. Our next update, this is, I'm adding this to updates because it connects to that story about protein analysis as something that can supplement or perhaps uh, add to our studies of DNA. This one is to do with a smudges and bloodstains found on a letter. 
This letter is dated to August the 4th, 1475. It was written to the burghers of Cebu by a man describing himself as, quote, the prince of the trans alpine regions. He informed the trans townspeople that he would soon be taking up residence among them. He signed with a name sure to strike fear into their hearts, Vlad Dracula. The study, the people involved in this study, are interested not on the words of the page, but by something else. The physical remains of the prince himself, including molecule fragments of his sweat, saliva and tears. Their work is harnessing the breathtaking advances in a field known as pro proteomics. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. Proteomics, which is the study of the interactions with in proteins within living cells and organisms. As we talked about last week, I believe the understanding is that because the way that proteins are processed by cells is something that's coded into one's DNA, understanding how particular proteins have been found and how they function can therefore be reverse engineered to find out about a person and potentially their genetic makeup. We're told this project is part of a scientific revolution that is profoundly expanding the type of information that can be gleaned from historical texts and artefacts, from X-ray and CT scanning to carbon dating and genetic sequences. And one of the reasons why that's possible is because protein simply survives longer, particularly in difficult climates like hot climates. Protein survives longer on things than DNA does. So uh, we will see how much new cool stuff gets found out through this new technology. It's quite exciting. And here is, I think, the update that everyone's been waiting for. Certainly me. I am bereft, <laughs> bereft, I tell you, to share with you that I am not the purchaser of this remarkable little dude with a um, a willy. Uh, it's not me. It, although we are told that it, we're told that it was purchased by a UK buyer, tis not me, tis someone else. It has sold this Celtic fertility figure has sold for £2,200, which I think, frankly, is a steal because this pendant is <laughs> just glorious. Um, for those who weren't here last week and who can't see the image clearly, I will tell you what we have here. This was found by a metal detector detectorist rather uh, and it's believed to date back to the first century and it might be a buckle to hold a belt and scabbard for a sword or additionally it could be a pendant it uh, measures 2.2 inches or 5.5 centimeters long by 0.5 of an inch or 1.2 centimeters it's a male figure with an over a hinged oversized phallus that would have been symbolic of would, would have had symbolic powers of good luck and warding off evil spirits and may have served as a locking mechanism for a buckle to hold a belt and scabbard for a sword <laughs> See the comments. okay friends if you have small children nearby <laughs> cover their eyes because this is i'm just gonna spend a little bit of time in the comments um i think it's a bargain too wheezy squeeze book i i think someone's done that got an absolute steal there pen is so unique i thought it would sell for more too Although I suppose maybe people don't find the joy of the willy that we do. Sad times. Um, you thought it was like a bone or a hairpin to got a better look? Yes. <laughs> this is the one. This is the one that got me. <laughs> Sir or ma'am, thank you. You're terrible, but I like you. <laughs> we can't start this early. We can't start this early. And as for you, Hadrian, look, it got cold. <laughs> it got cold. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. <laughs> um, it looks too small for a bird of any kind. Look, it's not the size that matters. It's what you do with the cows. <laughs> um I don't think it has shrunk. It's not the it's not the wooden not the wooden one. Um, Jared, I promise, I swear, it's not me that bought it. But best trust and believe, trust and believe. If I had on my in my person and in my possession this delightful <laughs> Willie, best believe I would be waggling it at you right now as we very speak. Uh, <laughs> um, 
with any luck, copies will be on Etsy soon and I will wear it round my neck with pride. <laughs> so that's the first of our of our um the first of our Willy stories. It's not the last, friends, so buckle up. I will be saving one till near the very end. This is a good question. Are there any cultures that are out there that celebrate breasts in buckle form? I, I mean, I think that surely Hooters does belt buckles. Surely. And I'm also, there are plenty of um, statues, etc., uh, of boobies and infertility things that are, have, from all cultures, lots of boobies and female forms all over the shop. We do have another update. This one is some is from the legal updates on that conversation that's going on with uh, an individual who's trying to sue an American art gallery who were loaned a painting by someone else. He claims the painting is his. This is where we are with it. So we have, we got to, I think we're all on the, on the place where the motions panel of the Sixth Circuit granted the plaintiff's motion and issued an injunction ordering the museum to maintain possession of the painting pending the outcome of the appeal. So the, the court isn't saying you have to give it back to this person who's claiming it is theirs. What it is saying is you can't let it leave your gallery or the country. The panel agreed with the plaintiff that Congress delegated to the executive branch only the questions of whether an artwork is of cultural significance and whether importing and displaying it would be the national interest. So we carry on. The parties are now briefing the appeal on the merits. They are doing so on an expedited schedule. So I'm assuming that means quicker. That's what expedited tends to mean in my brain. So the briefing is scheduled to be completed by March the 14th. So tomorrow, friends. And the court is likely to decide the appeal soon thereafter. Based on the motions panel injunction ruling, the Sixth Circuit seems likely to reserve the district court's decision and remand to the court to decide if the painting is immune from seizure. That question will turn on whether the museum obtained the painting pursuant to an agreement with the painting's owner or custodian. So we're going to have to find out who the true owner or custodian of the painting is. Resolving that issue will presumably require deciding whether the painting's identified lender had any right to possess the painting and lend it, and presumably also, if not, then if the claimant has any right that might work in the same way. If the district court must decide who can lawfully possess the painting, then going forward, other putative owners of other artworks loaned to US museums could ensnare those works in litigation, require the borrower museums to hold the art until the ownership disputes are resolved. Such lawsuits could, as the Amici museums warn, make it more difficult for US institutions to import and display significant pieces of art and cultural heritage. We will continue to monitor this appeal and will publish an update after the Sixth Circuit issues its decision. And I can certainly see how that's going to be frustrating if somebody can just go that's my painting I'm going to put it into court and it's going to hold it up I, I can I can assume and imagine that there are ways that bad actors will be able to profit from that there are there are always ways if there's if there's a loophole that can be where time can be extracted on something there are ways in which people can profit from that however my question on this is wouldn't all of these concerns be lessened may be reduced completely if every piece of artwork that was being loaned or given or sold to a gallery or museum if the provenance was ironclad and if it wasn't ironclad having to do that work to get it as ironclad as, pro as possible and doesn't it therefore mean that we could can't just have shonky authentications where people are winging it, so to speak, because they would have to be potentially aware that there might this might be tested in a court of law. Does it perhaps push people who are offering those authentications to do their jobs properly? Um, 
So it's it's going to cause problems. It's going. To, I think it would it would cause more problems as you as you say here, crazy Osh lady. If people are choosing to import and display things that have an iffy background, uh, and Carol. So on the flip side, the real owner should be grateful that the painting has been found. Yes, I mean, it, if this is a way for pieces to make their way back to their true owners, then more's the better. I mean, we could also have a, a much larger conversation about important pieces of art in private collections. I know they are there, but when you have, if somebody has, I don't know, seven Picassos and no one in the world gets to see them, I I, I wonder about what that means. I, I think that the art, and particularly art of, of importance, should be available, preferably in its, or in its place of origin, for as many people as possible to see it. And, and the thing about private collections is there's no requirement to make them publicly available online even. There's also no requirement to take any care of them. The, the amount of great houses in my country that have incredible libraries, to, first editions of texts that would just utterly blow your mind. And they have been in these families for centuries and when I tell you the stories I've heard about how poorly kept some of these books are, how collections have been allowed to run to rack and ruin, sometimes <laughs> the legal owner of something should have responsibilities, is all I'm going to say, is all I'm going to say. It sounds like a good thing unless you're on museum counting or not having to document having to document this stuff. I agree, Hadrian. I think, and I'm sure I'm I I am sure that there will be people who know more about this. And frequently museums are heavily underfunded and understaffed. And I am sure that there are museums and people in museums can that can come in and go, this is why this is a problem. And people being reticent to loan is a problem because it just means that stuff stays in private collections for longer and no one sees it for longer. Uh, and no one checks on how it's being kept either. It's a knotty one, but this is this still remains a most peculiar story. And I'm hoping that come tomorrow, so next week, we will have an update that might make things clearer as to what the blip, blip, blip is going on. <laughs> We're on to repatriations. This is a much longer story. This is a story that comes from NBC, but they wrote it in conjunction with ProPublica. That's a publication that I only learned about through doing this, people sharing the incredible work the journalists there do. So this is a piece that's written in conjunction with them. So as you can imagine, it's much longer. Of course, it's linked. Check it out. But it's talking about how a professor from the UC Berkeley, 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 I think it's Berkeley. We call it Berkeley, but I think it's different in the States. It's suspected and alleged that he taught with human remains that are suspected to be Native American. This is, in quotes, famed professor Tim White, who used a vast collection of human remains, bones sorted by body part stored in wooden bins to teach anthropology at the University of California, uh, Berkshire, Berkeley, California. OK, because I think we call it we'd call it we'd pronounce that as Berkeley um, or Berkshire. So this is Berkeley for you. Berkeley. The. He is he is listed as being a world renowned ex expert on human evolution, and he said that the collection was passed through down through generations of anthropology professors before he started teaching in the late 1970s. In, he says, it came with no records and most were not labelled or said only la la lab, so laboratory. Uh, but this simple description masked a dark history the administrators at the university have recently acknowledged. The university conducted an analysis of the collection after White reported its content in response to a university system-wide order in 2020 to search for human remains. Administrators disclosed to state officials in May that the analysis found the collection includes the remains of at least 95 people excavated from grave sites, many of them likely Native Americans from California. And this is according to previously unreported documents that were obtained by ProPublica 
and NBC. The university's disclosure was particularly painful because it involved a professor who many Indigenous people already viewed as a primary antagonist, according to interviews with tribal members. Uh, there was a human skull in your science classroom, so not a model. It was a real wild. Okay. I'm pretty sure our skeleton was, if we had one, um, I'm pretty sure the skeleton was like like a plasticky, not a person-y. Um, uh, wow. <laughs> Burke in in America, not Bark. Ah, uh, you see, this is where this is where the, the, we get confused with each other. Um, this gentleman, Sam Cohen, is an attorney for the tribe, and I think he looks. I mean, it's not a great picture of him because it could it could show him in better light, but he seems to be doing on the right side of history. Um, Cohen, the lawyer, said that White is considered untouchable. I think by. Berkeley, because he's so famous in human evolution, he basically wasn't going to voluntarily comply with anything until he was forced. Uh, the professor in question said he was unsure how the remains ended up in the teaching laboratory. Well, OK, odd. He suggested they may have been mistakenly placed in his lab during a move years ago while he was overseas. Oopsie doopsies. Uh, he provided ProPublica and NBC News with a copy of an email from an investigator with UC Berkeley's Office of Risk and Compliance Services, which said the office found no violation on his part regarding the Chumash or Shumash remains. UC Berkeley declined to comment on the outcome of the investigation, calling it a personal matter. Call me old fashioned, but I would say that grave robbing was a criminal matter. <laughs> but you know, um, he claims that he has accounted for everything that happened in granular detail. Well, that's good. Uh, the Chancellor of UC Berkeley apologized to the tribe in question in December in a letter and acknowledged, quote, We do understand that given our history, it's difficult for tribes to have confidence in our university and Professor White. The apology was, frankly, unsurprisingly little consolation, especially since it came with yet another painful acknowledgement. University records show there are still more unreturned Shumas ancestors, and so far they are yet to be found. The uh, uh, Chancellor assured the tribe that the university was committed to returning all Native American ancestors to all tribes, but the university estimates that it will be at least a decade before that happens. <laughs> Seeing some great comments going. Oh, interesting, Hadrian. Um, I I have my geography is appalling at any point, um, but that's interesting. So this is this is potentially um, a a long distance uh, crime. Uh, and my point, my thoughts too. I'm not sure that federal law would agree that it's a personal matter. <laughs> uh, another excellent point. If a random box of bones shows up in your lab, you'd ask where they came from, or is that just me? It's not just you, because if we aren't asking, if bones are just randomly turning up in university anthropology classrooms, just boxes of bones are just turning up, and the prof is like, oh, cool, 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 cool. Uh, no need to question that. That's probs fine. How many people are getting away with murder and they're just not, not my remains anymore? <laughs> put, everybody else put their fingerprints all over this. I mean, let's not put that off too far publicly. We're going to give people ideas. Um, I, I, I believe that this is that this is what's going on, that these are they are saying that they are they are stolen remains of ancestors rather than donated specimens. And I'm assuming that when it comes to donating specimens all of those will have their proper provenance i ask that because there have been some very concerning claims about things like in body worlds etc where remains were donated and there is a hefty question as to how voluntary or actual those donations were
this is probably before developers were required to have a Native American person on site during any excavation. I have I have no doubt that it was. I have absolutely no doubt that it's worked that it was. And um <laughs> a new box of bones would be sus, but old bones is someone else's detritus. I mean, I I think if someone just dropped some bones on my lap, I'd have some some questions. Right, let us um hop on. We have a repatriation of a work by Kandinsky. This has been recovered by the heirs of a Jewish Holocaust victim. These are the descendants of Johanna Margaretha Stone, Stern, who was murdered in Auschwitz. There are 13 survivors who are heirs of the Stearns, and they're going to share in the proceeds of this sale. It's, it's sold for a record 45 Five million dollars. Included in that number of 13 survivors include includes one member of the family who was in hiding during the war. Uh, nothing else can nothing can undo the wrongs of the past, said a statement from the family, but the painting's restitution was immensely significant to us because it's, it's an acknowledgement and partially closes the wound that had remained open over the generations. This sale was part of a series of, au of auctions taking place in London that were devoted to modern and contemporary art. And if you wish to read the article. Oh, you think it was a spelling error. A personnel matter rather than a personal matter. Oh, sorry, I my my, my my eyesight is very bad. It's not saying a personal matter. It is saying a personnel matter, and I need to get glasses. You are correct. I take it back. Thank you very much for spotting that. So that, you are correct there. That should be personnel, not a personal matter. I still don't see how it's a personnel matter. I'll be honest with you. I don't see how it's... I mean, I suppose it... Mm. Are they classifying it as human resources? No, 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 no. Is that is that worse? <laughs> is personnel matter worse than personal matter? Possibly. Um. Yes, this is this is lovely to hear. I'm not sure who's purchased the uh, Kandinsky piece or indeed anything else that was in the auction that isn't stated, um, whether it's a private collector or whether it's been purchased for a museum and thus more people be able to see it. Thank you, Michaela. Yes, also that, that could it could it might be my vision support. It might be the dyslexia coming out to play. That's that's um very very true. <laughs> Any rich items yet? Not yet. We'll get there. Don't you worry. It'll pop up. We have some more repatriation. Some spears taken by Captain Cook in 1770 are being returned to Sydney's La Perouse Aboriginal community. We have four spears taken during Captain James Cook landing at Botley Bay. They're going to be handed back to the Indigenous community some 250 years later. They are the last remaining of 40 spears that were gathered from Aboriginal people in 1770. Apparently, they are the earliest artefacts to be collected by Europeans, stolen by Europeans from Australia, that were documented and intact. A decision has been made for their permanent return after years of negotiations between the La Perouse Aboriginal Land Council, the Gugaga uh, Foundation, and museums in Australia and the UK. We're told the spears were pretty much the first point of European contact, particularly British contact with Aboriginal Australia. I think for us it's a momentous occasion that where Australia's history began in 1770 on the shores of Botany Bay, the spears that were undoubtedly taken without permission are returned to their rightful people. It's said that these spears are going to be stored at the National Museum until they are displayed at Colonel, where the or Colonel, when the visitor centre is rebuilt. Ultimately, they will be put on permanent display for everyone to go and see at the very spot they were taken 250 years ago. We 
when you hear spear, you usually think of a stone or metal head attached to a stick. I didn't know they came with. Yeah, yes, I'm not sure what makes a spear a spear. That is a that is a uh, question. That is a question to for for etymology. Interesting. Um, first point of contact. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Well done. Oh, and we've got some update on some of that. More. Uh, EB Terrell, personnel matter equals university lawyers want discussions behind closed doors. Fair. Good. Yeah. Fair. Fair point. Fair point. Well made. Um, I could well be fishing implements, could well be all sorts of, I mean, I wouldn't want it thrown at me. And I can equally see how it would be good for fish, for fishing. Equally, though, I think that that might be the case with most spears, um, unless you kind of get to the real sort of heavily metal ones up at the top. They're all going to be quite good for hunting and also fighting. The Vatican has returned some three sculptural fragments from the Parthenon marbles. They are expected to arrive in Athens later this month, and there's going to be a ceremony on March 24th to receive them. The Vatican is terming it an ecumenical donation to the Orthodox Christian Archbishop of Athens in Greece, so not necessarily a state-to-state -state transfer. And this, this news item is flagging it as essentially putting extra pressure on the British Museum. The British Museum has refused decades of appeals from Greece to return its much larger collection of Parthenon sculptures, which have been a centrepiece to the British Museum since 1816. It's worth pointing out that the British Museum wouldn't be empty. There's loads of stuff in the basement, just saying. These 5th century sculptures are mostly remnants of a 160 metre or 520 20-foot frieze that ran around the outer walls of the Parthenon temple on the Acropolis. Athens argues the sculptures were illegally taken when Greece was under Ottoman Turkish occupation and should be returned from, for permanent display besides other surviving Parthenon sculptures. The British Museum, on the other hand, continues to insist that it will not break up its collection. But there has been a change of tone recently as museums around the world seek to address concerns about the way ancient artefacts were acquired during periods of imperial domination and colonial expansion. Um, <laughs> the Vatican miracle, excellent punning, well done. Um, and an uh, excellent point when the Vatican is more movable on a point than you, it's time to reconsider when we are giving points to the Vatican. <laughs> yes. And we've talked about this before as well. The British Museum could absolutely make copies. I have mentioned this many times that one of our most beloved things in a museum, I would say in this country, is Dippy, the Diplodocus dinosaur, which is in British museums, in the Natural History Museum, that is a cast. The, there are about five dippies across the world, and everybody has always wanted to pick a dippy. It is a when when it was moved out of the Great Hall of the Natural History Museum, there was uproar. Everyone loves dippy. Um, I do. What's going to be interesting? It's interesting that this point comes up. What's going to be interesting with this repatriation of the Vatican is if quote the floodgates then open and people start going. So Vatican, <laughs> what else you got? Let me have a little look see. Because that is the argument that the British Museum and other institutions have made, that if we start down this path, we are going to essentially open the floodgates. Let's see if that's true for the Vatican, shall we? Hundreds of cultural treasures that were seized from Ethiopia have been found in London. They were seized by British soldiers and they have been identified in London after new research. Andrew Heavens has written a book called The Prince and the Plunder, which details how treasure was brought back to the UK after the British invaded Ethiopia in 1868. He's catalogued 538 items in London, including everything from scraps of manuscripts torn up and stuffed inside a charm bracelet to royal finery and 
This can be found everywhere from major institutions to council collections. The author of this text, who worked in Ethiopia as a journalist, has said one of the most striking things is the sheer volume. Quote, the bulk of the plunder was small ticket items brought back in soldiers' knapsacks and pockets. Almost all the items are not on display. I have tracked down these items uh, as a way of telling the story. It's not a campaigning book demanding they be returned. That would be up to Ethiopia. Some of the items are well known, including a crown and a royal wedding dress that are held by the VNA, uh, to holy relics called Talbots that are kept in Westminster Abbey and the British Museum. There are manuscripts in the Welcome Collection, a scrap of scroll measuring less than a centimetre held by Southwark Council. Here we have a dress belonging to Queen Wazaro Tarunesh. The VNA has discussed the prospect of returning items via long term loans, um, while the Welcome Collection said it had not received any repatriation requests but would, quote, take such decisions on a case by case basis. Westminster Abbey said it was, quote, very aware of the importance and significance of the Ethiopian tablet, and it was, quote, kept in a very sacred place in the church, covered and hidden from view. The British Museum said, quote, our sustained ambition is to lend these objects to an Ethiopian Orthodox church in Britain so they can be cared for by the clergy within their traditions. All of this is coming amid the increasingly contested debate about whether museums should return artefacts to their countries of origin. We've just talked about the Parthenon marbles, but also, of course, things that we've talked about a lot are the Benin bronzes. All of these are held in great numbers by the British Museum. This is an excellent question. Did the demands for museums to return things increase after the first Black Panther movie came out? I don't know. And I wonder if I could look into that. Um, that that's an interesting chicken and egg which came first was black panther responding to and amplifying existing calls or did it spark something that's really interesting um yeah shannon this is uh, lend their own stuff is a big is a big question we're seeing yeah um yeah the the word lend is doing a lot of heavy lifting it's doing a lot of heavy lifting. I, I'm going to come around your house and I'm going to steal your toast. But don't worry, I'll let you have it back on a long term loan. Yeah, I agreed. Agreed. Turkey apparently is not allowed to recover an ancient stargazer idol from Christie's, according to a US court. I do have the statue in the next slide. So we'll have a look at that. This is a 6,000 year old marble idol uh, that is being held by Christie's and hedge fund billionaire, Michael Steinhardt. His name has come up a lot in these discussions. Um, and the reason why apparently is because they waited an unreasonably long time to claim it had been looted. The second US circuit court of appeals in Manhattan said Turkey quote, had reason to know by the 1990s that the Gwenol stargazer might have been wrongfully removed from its territory. It said Turkey had therefore, quote, slept on its rights by waiting to sue Christie's and Steinhardt, the idol's owner, until April 2017. Quote, Turkey sat on its hands despite signals from its own Ministry of Culture that the stargazer was in New York City. Turkey's failure to bring a claim or even investigate it until 2017 was unreasonable. The, we are told the decision will not deter the Republic of Turkey from continuing to aggressively seek the return of cultural objects that have been stolen from it. And I believe this to be the stargazer in question. It's about nine inches or 22.9 centimetres tall, and it gets the name because the head tilts slightly up as if gazing at the stars. In claiming ownership, Turkey cited the 1906 Ottoman Decree, which asserts broad rights to antiquities. 
the country said it would be impossible to investigate everything in its, quote, vast trove of unknown ancient artefacts. And it was, quote, neither aware nor should it have been aware of its claim to the stargazer until Christie's described the idol's limited provenance in an auction catalogue. The response to that is that the stargazer has not lived in secrecy. Steinhardt and his wife paid one point five million dollars for Stargazer in nineteen ninety three. Christie's auctioned it for fourteen point five million, but the buyer walked away, presumably because this is now a contested piece. This decision took place on Wednesday. Upheld a September twenty twenty one ruling. The case is Republic of Turkey versus Christie's Inc. et al. Second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. So um, we will see where that goes. Sounds like you're saying they're saying they're saying you snooze, you lose. Yeah, I did. I know that there is like statute of limitations and stuff, but come on, <laughs> it's Debbie. I think it's an absolutely beautiful piece. I think it's wonderful. I would love to see it in person. I think it's lovely. Uh, my, yeah, my sympathy for billionaire owner of a proven loose object is pretty much long existence. Same. Additionally, because I've I rem I've I've seen that bloke's name far too many. I'm I am too familiar with this guy's name to have any sympathy. Could could Turkey steal it back and then hide it until statute of limitations runs out? Yeah, I mean let's 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 do a let's do some stealing back and forth. Um, biggest question is how did it leave Turkey? It, that's an excellent question. There have there has been conflict. It's I, it's unclear from the provenance we know is limited. That's one of the reasons why Turkey went, hang on a second. Um, the provenance is limited. So I don't know how far it goes back when it made its way to the States. Um, but they are claiming that it shouldn't, it shouldn't be where it is. This um, is something that we have seen previously. We have seen um, because of various scandals that have come out, wings, rooms, galleries in museums and art galleries having to be renamed because the family that paid a bunch of money to have their name on the door have fallen into such scandal. And this is happening in the Denver Art Museum. They've removed one donor's name after an investigation linked them to Douglas Latchford. Oh, this one, one pops back. Uh, isn't Steinhardt forbidden from acquiring any more antiquities? I can't remember if he's the one because there, but that, that make, I don't want to say that that's for sure, but that feels, that rings bells for me. Um, Cause there certainly was someone in a previous article. And I know that, that name a lot. Right. So we have, on Friday, it was announced that they'd removed the name of a former trustee from one of its galleries after it was revealed that she had ties to Douglas Latchford, the disgraced antiquities dealer who died in 2020. The Denver Art Museum uh, accepted a donation in 2018 of $125,000 from Emma C. Bunker. And this is all well and good. They put a name on the gallery until last year, an investigative report from the Denver Post revealed that the bunker who died in 2021 had collaborated with Latchford to legitimise Camir antiques, um, including allegedly strategizing about how to forge signatures that would be necessary to import and sell the antiques, authoring books that gave further credence to Latchford lo Latchford's looted objects, and personally vouching for objects she knew to have falsified provenance documents oh boy in a late in a letter dated january 25th that was published in the denver post the denver art museum informed the colorado attorney general's office which has oversight over non-profits operating in the state that it will remove bunker the bunker name 
from its walls and return the cash donations to the Bunker family and estate. OK, um, OK. Um, after Latchford was indicted by a federal grand jury in October 2019, the Denver Art Museum, quote, proactively reached out to officials in Cambodia and Thailand and ultimately repatriated several artworks in its collection associated with Latchford. Prior to her death, Bunker's role in Latchford's criminal activities was part of the Department of Justice investigation. So, I can see why they took her name down. What a mess. How embarrassing. Um, and, and the thing is that, that one of the things that we have seen consistently is that this isn't just happening on the private market. The amount of times that your friend of mine, Alvin Bragg, has had to go into the Met and been like, TikTok, time's running out. It, it, it points to the fact that this is industrial to me. That, that this this goes far beyond um, back alley dealing or private art gallery dealing like this. There is involvement across the board, I would say. Um, and I and I don't think we have the full grasp of just how far this web reaches, because it, it's clearly, clearly a big boy. We are moving on now to the new news. As per, this is broadly speaking organised by date or date range. So we're starting in Mesopotamia, a 4,500 year old Sumerian temple that is dedicated to a mighty Mesopotamian thunder god has been found in Iraq. This, or rather the remains of it have been found. This long lost temple was built out of mud brick and was the spectacular centrepiece to the ancient city of Girzu. If I've mispronounced that, I do apologise. But that's now the archaeological site known as Tello. At the heart of this city, they discovered, and that they are still currently excavating, one of the most important sacred spaces of all of ancient Mesopotamia. I see the discussions about rituals coming up. No drinking games are approved by me. Just saying, just putting it out there. Um, this was a bustling cultural centre at the heart of Mesopotamia, which covers an area between the Euphrates and the, the Tigris and includes Iraq, eastern Syria, southeastern Turkey, part of western Iraq and Kuwait. And it's thought to be home to some of the first civilizations. A French archaeologist, Ernest de Sarzac, first discovered the remains of this place in 1877 and removed all the artefacts he could find. Of course he did. <laughs> Including a 4,000-year-old statue of the Sumerian king Gudea, who ruled the city at the end of the third millennium um, BCE. As a, revolt, many, as a result, many people thought there was nothing left to excavate. And, of, of course, multiple periods of conflict have also prevented scientists from accessing the site and doing further digs um, but it was believed that there that there were more secrets to be revealed and it certainly seems sees that there will be uh, and presumably this site will be dug further and more things will be learnt indeed wheezy squeeze box the cradle of civilization uh, Jesse, I wouldn't even recommend taking espresso shots because the amount of times that we say things like ritual purposes or I'm going to laugh at a phallus, I don't think that level of caffeine is is good for anybody. I just, I don't think it's a good time. And Jared, I do not approve this message. I do not, do not approve this message. Carol, what did Ernest do with those artefacts? Good question. I'm assuming um, we either don't know or... <laughs> Went back to France. I'll check up. I'll have to check up on it. Um, but doesn't say. Don't think. Don't think. Don't think we where we want them to be. Put it that way. Considering we are talking eighteen seventy seven, not famed for their sensitive handling of other people's stuff in that period, are they? No. So. We have a Bronze Age set of ice skates with bone blades that have been found in China. These are 3,500-year-old ice skates crafted from animal bones. 
Um, they, they've come from a mountainous area that archaeologists think might have been the birthplace of skiing. These are the oldest ice skates ever found in China, and they were made from the bones of oxen and horses. They were found in a tomb in the Gaotai ruins, which is about 240 miles west of the regional capital, Uruk Uram Uramki. I may have pronounced that very wrong, and I apologise if I have. It's not known if the skates were used for hunting or for regular travel. They consist of a straight piece of bone with holes at the end so they could be strapped to footwear. The resulting blade is, as we can see, very flat compared with modern skates, but it would have formed a cutting edge to allow the wearer to slide across the ice. These newly found skates are almost exactly the same as ice skates from prehist Europe, which can be interpreted as new evidence of a theorised exchange of information between the ancient West and East during the Bronze Age. They are also a rare physical material for studying the origins of ice skating in China. Um, I believe they are being referred to as blades because that is what the, the bit that sits on the bottom of ice skating boots are called. Of course, now they are metal. But I, as far as I know, the things you skate on on your boot are called a blade, like a roller blade, I'm assuming. I got sent this one a lot. So there's been a dig in Egypt that has found a smiling mini sphinx, which might represent the Emperor Claudius. These were found near the Hathor Temple, which is one of Egypt's best, or Hathor Temple, Temple, which is one of Egypt's best preserved ancient sites. It's a limestone sphinx with a smiley face and two dimples, which sounds adorable. Uh, it's much smaller than the famous sphinx at the Pyramid of Giza, which I think you can <laughs> pretty much tell as there's a bloke sat next to it and <laughs> we don't have giants. <laughs> so it's clearly quite a bit smaller. Um because that that the other sphinx is 20 meters high and i don't think this dude is is that tall they were these artifacts the artifacts were found inside a two level tomb in the temple of dendera in the quena province which is 280 miles south of the capital cairo the emperor claudius whom archaeologists believe the statue's smiling feature might belong to ruled between 41 and 54 uh, AD and extended Roman rule into North Africa. The archaeologists are studying, going to study the markings on the stone slab, which could reveal more information about the statue's identity. And beside the this beautifully ac and accurately carved sphinx, they've also found a Roman era stone slab with demotic and hieroglyphic inscriptions. The limestone shrine includes a two-layer platform and a mud brick basin from the Byzantine era. Experts see these discoveries by the Egyptian government as a way of attracting more tourists to revive its tourism industry amid a severe economic crisis in Egypt. We've heard that quite a lot. And, of course, we do have the opening of their new museum, which I'm not sure if it's actually... We talked about this last week, that... Invited guests have gone in and taken pictures, but I'm not sure if um, the public public has gone in yet. How could it's Claudius? It's a good. It's a good question. I am assuming that it echoes and connects to other known sculptures that on are described as being of claudius i'm assuming that it's something that was there's something about it perhaps perhaps it is in fact the dimples that is a way of knowing who this person is um i will if i find out how they how they know i'll let you know next week we are sticking with hieroglyphs but this time we're hopping to ancient sudan Remains of an ancient temple with hieroglyphic inscriptions has been discovered in Sudan. This temple dates back around 2,700 years when a kingdom called the Kush, or, or Kush maybe, ruled over a vast area which includes what's now Sudan, Egypt and parts of the Middle East. This temple remains were found at a medieval citadel 
called at Old Dongola, a site that's located between the third and fourth cataracts of the Nile River in modern day Sudan. Um, these The bricks that have been found at this temple have been decorated with figures and hieroglyphic inscriptions. Analysis of the iconography and script suggests they were part of a structure dating to the first millennium BCE. Research at this site, Old Dongla, is ongoing and it's led by an archaeologist at the Polish Centre of Mediterranean Archaeology. So if and or when there are further updates, I shall inform you. We are going Roman and we're going Roman in Leicester. This excavations um, done by the University of Leicester have uncovered a 1,800 year old altar, a stone altar from the Roman period and they found this beneath Leicester Cathedral. After the Roman conquest this town in Leicester was a was sited at an important river crossing along the Foss Way which is a major Roman road linking Lincoln to the northwest with Exeter to the southwest. The Roman occupation seems to have developed as a continuation of the existing Iron Age settlement. Um, there's a major Roman centre with a typical grid system emerging, numerous public buildings such as a forum and a basilica. The jury wall public baths and at least one temple identified as a Mithraeum. This stone altar was found in a cellar in the grounds of Leicester Cathedral and it's believed to be a shrine or cult room. So legitimately ritual purposes at play here. This cellar measures four by four metres. It's located three metres below current ground level, one metre below the contemporary Roman surface level. So it would have been a cellar even then. It was built in around the second century AD, but was deliberately dismantled and infilled probably in the late third or fourth century. This is the hole. <laughs> that they were in. Um, archaeologists from the University of Leicester Archaeological Services suggest the cellar was a private place of worship, either a family shrine or cult room where a small group of individuals shared in private worship. The university responsible for these finds have said that the discovery of a Roman altar at Leicester Cathedral is the first to ever be found in Leicester. It's an amazing find for the Leicester Cathedral Revealed project. For centuries, there's been a tradition that a Roman temple once stood on the site of the present cathedral. And it looks like that tradition, that myth, if you will, actually has some fact be up behind it and beyond it. In Pompeii, some lovely little fluffy sheep are helping with conservation. As you can see here, they are helping to preserve the ruins of Pompeii. So we've got everything. We're talking about the robots there they're on security detail last week and now we have grazing sheep who are stopping grass and plants from growing on parts of the city so this flock of sheep are helping to preserve the ruins of Pompeii um, and they are assisting archaeologists in their work archaeologists still have way more to uncover at Pompeii they've only un they've only uncovered around two-thirds of the 66 hectare site since the excavations began 250 years ago. I'm going to be honest with you. I have absolutely no idea how big a hectare is. I think big-ish. Um, it sounds impressive. So preserving the unexplored sections of the ancient city against erosion by nature is, um, is really a priority for those who are managing the site. So they have got 150 sheep deployed on this area to keep the ground vegetation in, in check and to... Um, sort everything out. The person in charge has said, quote, we try to explain that this is actually a sustainable project and it helps the ruins. It's also something which really gives an idea of how Pompeii was in the time it was rediscovered. It was woods, vineyards, sheep, and it was this kind of rural environment. And in the midst of it, you had Pompeii. And from the I suppose old fashioned use of sheep. We go right back to the modern, still at Pompeii. We have AI robots that are being used to piece together ancient fresco fragments that have been discovered at Pompeii. The technology is being acronymed, has the acronym 
REPAIR, which stands for Reconstructing the Past Artificial Intelligence. It's made to solve intricate puzzles whose components may be broken, faded, scattered, or completely absent. It's artificial program, an artificial intelligence program, AI program, examines the numerous pieces of a centuries old Roman vase and determines how they should fit together. And then it's got a pair of robotic arms to put them back together. The plan is, the intention is to save archaeologists time. Um, bless you um, for that explanation, Marie. I don't know what an acre is. <laughs> I don't know how big an acre is. <laughs> so, um, so it's a hectare is bigger than an acre. Um, <laughs> uh, I I know meters. If that's of any use. <laughs> um, this seems to be the robot in action we're seeing here. One of the first one of the project's initial goals is a pair of 2000 year old frescoes from Pompeii. The house of the painters at work at the Insula of the Chase Lovers originally housed one fresco and the Scholar Armatorum provided the other. Repair would eventually be able to handle intricate tasks nearly entirely on its own from scanning through assembly. Everything goes according to plan. The robot will be able to assemble the vessel over overnight and when the archaeologist returns from the excavation site in the evening they will be able to get the full vessel the next morning quote the computer will present intermediate results to us as necessary and will ask to consult with a human expert who will determine whether the result is good or whether the computer will have to be adjusted to help point it in the right direction people have always built machines to help them in our project autonomous machines will be helped by people and if it works, I think it could be brilliant. I think also there is a lot to be said for, um, I know, the sensitivity, but also the strength that can be obtained with robotics and robotic hands. This could be ideal for dealing with incredibly delicate things. It could also be ideal with delicate, with dealing with remains um, and artefacts, remains of artefacts that would be damaged by coming into contact with human breath human hands whatever we might find so i can definitely see the place for this i i, I know that it will be being heavily supervised <laughs> before it's allowed to go touchy touching anything staying with rome we have these spikes that look very upsetting they were like a kind of um i suppose those like wall spikes really built to protect the silver mines they um, are wooden defences surrounding an ancient Roman military base that have been topped with sharpened wooden stakes in a kind of way like we would do barbed wire today. They used, to find them, they used geomagnetic prospecting. And archaeologists doing this have since discovered evidence of no fewer than 40 towers on this site, as well as a smaller camp on opposite sides of the valley. This is in uh, near the town of Bad Ems in the Rhineland Palatinate in Germany. This area appears to have served only as a camp for a couple of years before um, being burnt down. And it appears that Romans were tunnelling into the earth, searching for deposits of silver. At first, the archaeologists, archaeologists believed that the fire remains and melted slag were evidence that the Romans had set up smelting works to process silver ore. Can I just... Be childish for one moment. In um, science class, did everybody else really enjoy the words um, molten slag? Or was it just the people I went to school with? I'm five. Um, the writings of the historian Tacitus reveal that the Ro Roman governor, Curtius Rufus' efforts to mine silver in the area had failed. They'd expected untold riches. The Romans set up a heavily fortified base, um, which explains the um, barbed wire-like defences. But unfortunately, a rich vein of the precious metal would not be unearthed in the area until millennia later. Uh, there was enough silver that the Romans could have continued mining operations for two centuries, if only they'd kept digging. Here's what you could have won, pals. The remains of the ancient fire, it would seem, came from a watchtower, not a profitable smelting works. 
These futile ancient efforts make for a fascinating story. Frederick Orth, the leader of the excavation since 2019, won first prize for his account of the history of the site at the 2022 Wiesbaden Science Slam. The excavations and science work is slated to continue, uh, and so I suppose we will see what is on display. The ancient wooden spikes are, however, now um, at the Romis Germansches Central Museum in Mans, and I assume they are being tested and perhaps are already on display. So that might be something to check out. If people are commenting, I think the comments might have frozen. Um, so I don't, are from, they've frozen for me. So if I'm not replying, it's because the comments seem to have stopped. Let's see if they start up again. If I'm, I'm not ignoring you. Um, I apologise if you are trying to message in the description, in the chat. We've got, staying with Rome, a hoard of Roman coins that have been found in the Swiss Alps by a hiker. This site, we're told, is several hours from the nearest road and also quite far from hiking paths. It's an unusual spot to find all of this stuff. and But in it, there is a concentrated selection of treasures that have been amassed there. And so it's now thought that the place that this person stumbled upon was a site of great religious significance or even ritual. We are told they are at the beginning of their investigations, but the thought is that it's a holy place. Somewhere where people went to deposit votive offerings, coins, but also other objects. So they are thinking it might have been a place of pilgrimage. They are asserting that the mountains clearly had some kind of religious significance. It And it might have been significant because of the little rock crystals that the team found in amongst with the coins. These rock crystals that they found occur naturally there, but they might be part of the reason why this place was considered special. This mountain pass connects the Swiss plateau north of the Alps with northern Italy. And um, these are routes that are frequented by the Romans during this period. As a result, high Alpine finds from the Roman period are not uncommon, but it's usually single coins or other items on passes or sometimes mountain tops. The researchers are going to continue to study the site, understandably, to find out more of its potential historical significance. We're told, quote, it's an interesting site because it shows that the Roman population of the region didn't only worship the mountains from afar, but they also went up close to them to deposit votive offerings. I'm just wondering why this is frozen. It's definitely frozen. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Um if you are commenting, I can't see what you're saying. I'm just wondering if I can perhaps pull it up somewhere else so that I can see what's going on because I want to be involved in the comments. What it also means is that I'm not going to be necessarily able to share them. I turn my phone down and put it on there in the hopes that I can catch up with the comments. Um, how frustrating. Yes, I can see you. You've, you're saying you've been cast adrift. I can see the comments on the phone. It's just not coming up on my computer, which is somewhat frustrating. Um, so I will keep an eye on that uh, and talk to you as it pops up. See, it's all popping up here in the comments, but not on my on my computer. So we will continue on and have a chat. Oh, the husband's here. He's looking at it. I've got it on my phone, but thank you, darling, very much. He's he's in he's in the chat. So if anybody misbehaves, he is the only person with um, removable rights. He can he can boot people if people are being naughty. Uh, <laughs> um, we have we're moving on from the Roman, and we're going to the Norse. The oldest inscription of the name Odin has been found. Scientists have found this, uh, the old description featuring the Norse god Odin on a gold brectate in the Vindelev hoard. So this means they can now date the Nordic mythology to 150 years earlier than previously thought. The runes are most spectacular since the golden horns and they might help researchers to understand prehistoric runic inscriptions. 
This uh, is part of a find that was announced about a year and a half ago. Of uh, and what was found was what has been described as one of the biggest, richest, and most beautiful hordes of gold at Vindelev near Yelling, and it caused understandably quite the sensation. It turns out that these treasures concealed another surprise, namely this ne this um, description or inscription rather featuring the name Odin. The National Museum of Denmark's runologist, writing expert, Lisbeth Emer, and the linguist Krista Vowers made the discovery, quote, the runic inscription was the most difficult I've ever had to interpret in all my years as a runologist at the National Museum of Denmark. But the discovery is also absolutely amazing. It's the first time in the history of the world that Odin's name is mentioned. This means that Norse mythology can now be dated all the way back to the 5th century, this just makes the Vindel of Horde even more spectacular. Since the Golden Horns, I've never seen such well-executed -ex runes and such a long text on a Danish find from this period. It may help us understand other prehistoric runic inscriptions, which we haven't been able to read. Um, ha, I see. Oh, you're calling. You're calling the. You're calling my husband. <laughs> <laughs> the um, substitute teacher. Does he have a moderator spanner? That sounds dirty. I don't know. He should. He has moderator's powers. Um, but he'll only he'll only appear if someone's been very naughty. What's fascinating about this is we are told that you can watch the moment when the research discovered this inscription in the DRTV documentary series called The Odin Riddle. And together with the rest of this horde, this Bracteate with the world's oldest Odin inscription is now on display at the National Museum of Denmark in the exhibition The Hunt for Denmark's Past. And if you check out the links in the description box and you check out this news link, you can read more about the exhibition there and presumably attend it. If you do make it down, let us know what you thought of it and what it was like to see that inscription of the name Odin. Um, give hubby a glass of wine we we will he, we, we might we might leave it to the weekend um but we'll make sure that he is well oiled um and he's currently cooking my dinner as well because he is a very good very good bean um people being naughty in a dr cat live stream never mostly me um of, of recent weeks i have the one i am the one that's lowered the tone i recognize that thanks for sticking with me it, it might get worse. It might get better. We'll never know. <laughs> we have found this. Now, this, this find is, I saw the picture of this. It's one of those ones where I went, oh, so shiny and I like it. Um, and linked, there are, um, in the article link, there are more photographs. So do check them out. There has been found a medieval treasure find by a Dutch historian. This is a 1,000-year-old hoard of golden treasure that consists of four ear pendants, two strips of gold leaf, 39 silver coins, according to the Dutch uh, National Museum of Anti Antiquities. Uh, Lorenzo Ruggia, who's 27, and has been hunting treasure since he was 10. He found the treasure in 2021. And he said, quote, it was very special discovering something this valuable. I can't really describe it. I never expected to discover anything like this. And he said it was hard to keep it a secret for two years. I could only imagine, sir. Look at it. Look at it. Weezy Sweezy is referring to me as a magpie. You, madam, sir, you are not wrong. Um, what was that supposed to be? That thing that I just showed is supposed to be this ear. Um, what's it called? An ear pendant. So I, I think maybe that's more than an earring. Um, the, the, he couldn't release what he'd found because this stuff needed time to be cleaned, investigated and dated. And they've now found that the youngest coin can be dated to around 1250, which is what makes them think that that's about the time when it would have been buried. Uh, they think that the jewellery by this point is already two centuries old, so it's presumably an expensive and cherished position. Golden jewellery from the high Middle Ages is extremely rare in the Netherlands. It's we don't know who or why the this hoard was buried, but they do point out there was 
a war raging between the Dutch regions of West Friesland and Holland in the middle of the 13th century, with the place where this was found, Hoogwood, being the epicentre. So perhaps someone buried it, someone who was powerful buried it at the time in the hope they'd be able to come back and dig it up later. And either they didn't make it back or they forgot where they put it. This treasure is given as a loan to the museum that's going to display it, but it will remain the official property of finder Lorenzo Ruggier. That's interesting. So um, isn't it utterly fabulous? Just <sighs> wowzers. Just gorgeous. I love it. We have another hoard. This one from the 17th century. We have 1,000 coins found in Poland. This is another metal detectorist find. This uh, they, they were searching for discarded tractor parts. I mean, I guess everyone needs a hobby on a Polish farm. And they found a completely different type of valuable metal. I'm guessing they probably weren't disappointed. <laughs> you go out for tractor, port, go out for tractor parts <laughs> and you come back with a set of 1000 coins i just i think you'd probably be okay with that it was found in late february in eastern poland and uh he was using a new mesh detector to find spare parts for his sister's tractor the mesh detector is in question which is adorable uh and then when the instrument started beeping in one of the farm's field he scraped away the topsoil and then coins started spilling out of a broken clay siwak which is a jug in the local style with one hand on a narrow neck. It must have been so close to the surface. Isn't that exciting? Uh, using a metal detector to search for buried relics without a permit is illegal in Poland. You were searching for tractor parts, were you? Okay. Um, so he contacted archaeologists in the nearby city of Lublin, about 95 miles or 150 kilometres southeast of Warsaw, and they came to the farm the next day. The investigation showed that the location of the hidden hoard was clearly outlined on the surface of the soil, which indicated that it had been buried there intentionally, according to a report in the Polish news outlet, First News. Look at it. Um, according to the Polish Metal Detectors website, Zaudawika history, such coins are known as Borantiki. I've definitely butchered that. Apologies. Uh, after Tito Levo Boratini, who was the manager of the Krakow Mint at the time. So the, the coins are named after him. This coin hoard is being transferred to specialists at a museum in the ne nearby city of Bayala Polaska for further investigations. Fragments of the broken clay jug and several pieces of fabric from the time were also found at the site. So investigations still to follow. And we will, I'm sure, have some fun with that. I'm seeing some excellent comments coming in. All I wanted was a flywheel and I came away with this lousy jug of coins. Um, spare parts. I do wonder. I mean, look, if my sister's tractor needed spare parts, maybe I would go digging for them in a field. I Maybe that's what I'd do with my time. Or maybe if I found something and thought, oh boy, this needs to be handed in, I, <laughs> I better make up a story so I don't get in trouble for doing something super illegal. I'd be like, tractor parts, pal, tractor parts. <laughs> Allegedly. Not, not my circus. <laughs> um, this one uh, I have some feelings about. We have an 18th century site in what is now, <coughs> pardon me, downtown Charlottesville. And there is going to be some building work, take a, a development being popped on this site. Uh, and whilst there, there's been a dig taking place and they have found some incredible, what might be a really incredible and useful historic site. <coughs> um, they have found hundreds of features, so many that haven't figured out what the patterning of them is yet. Um, carry on. At Court Square, the archaeologists want to map out the tavern property. So what they, they have found, they, they, they'd hoped to find the grave of the proprietor, but they didn't do that. They they hope to find, they, they, mapped, they want to map out the tavern property 
before work begins on a mammoth new building <coughs> pardon me to house the general district courts of both Abermal that's probably not right is it uh county and the city of charlottesville it's a race against the clock we're told as construction sized at 58,850 square feet is slated to begin next month hang on here's a question here's a question does this not is this not the case that in america that if you find something cool and useful archaeologically doesn't that stop building is that is that not what's happening? Um, so the building and its basement will destroy this site. So it's nice to, it'd be nice to get some documentation before it goes away completely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Why is, okay. Um, his team has found the likely outlines of the tavern stable, its kitchen and its trash pile or midden. And that has also um, produced a trove of 18th century ceramics including German, German stoneware and white salt glaze stoneware from Britain. They want to excavate it noting that he figures that the dead man's body was promptly fished out of that potable water source. We're very excited by this site. We could spend a year out here excavating all these features. Okay. S so you get a year. Um Apparently, they don't have that kind of time because the city has already handed over $6.84 million to the county for its portion of the new courts building. And the contractor, according to a county spokeswoman, Abby Stumpf, is slated to reveal total pricing on Friday. Already, the archaeology team has chewed through a week of the two-week extension that it was granted to sift the site. Two weeks, they need a year. Wowzers. Um Enlisting the help of the city's historic preservation and design planner, Jeff Werner, they're hoping for more. And so is Werner. So am I. So am I. We did not anticipate something this big. We live in a historic community and we want people to know where they're from and how they got here. Just as the city is, invest is funding the investigation of gravesite of enslaved people at Penn Park, which we've talked about in a previous, I believe that's the same site, we talked about previously, it would be almost inexcusable, they say, to build here without additional documentation. We have, quote, the opportunity to lift here to lift the veil a little bit and take a look at this time machine. Um, that it is more than time team gets, Debbie. I, 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 I grant you that. However, what time team also tends to have is they go in, do a test pit. If they find something of extraordinary interest, then they might go away. But the rest of the archaeological team swarms in to do the diggy and the findy. So they want a year. They're like, give you two weeks. <laughs> Tick tock. That's, that's wild to me. That is wild to me. Um, yeah, give them a year. We have a 126-year-old, well-preserved ship found at Lake Huron. And judging by this digital imagery, it looks like it's very well-preserved. Scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I find that really hard to say. Um, I'm going to call them NOAA. NOAA's Ark, is that where they've done that acronym? Cool. Uh, they have discovered remains of a 126 year old shipwreck in Lake Horon or Huron and it's remarkably well preserved for for over a century because of the cool waters in the Great Lakes it as we can see is sitting upright on the lake bed with its three masts still standing this is a 58 meter long ship and it sank in 1894 after colliding with a grain hauler apparently they call it Noah as well Lovely, Noah, it will do. It sank quickly, dragging the captain and six sailors underwater before the lifeboat could be detached. Only two crew members survived. They have used, we're told, cutting edge technology to locate a pristine shipwreck that was lost for over a century and also to learn more about our one of our nation's most important natural resources, the Great Lakes. Noah did not disclose the ship's location in hopes of keeping curious divers away while completing the documentation process. 
which makes sense. Oftentimes when when I get asked in these chats who found it, um, or where's it been found rather, I'm like, well, they've not announced it. They've given a rough location and there's probably a reason for that. And usually it's because they want to do more prodding about. Thunder Bay, Thunder Bay, fat sounds. Can you, do, if people live in Thunder Bay, are they like, yeah, where do you live? Thunder Bay. That's amazing. Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary plans to develop exhibits and multimedia products that will help tell the story of the Ironton. In the future, a deep water monitoring buoy will sit in the water to mark its location and guide divers to the ship. The discovery of Ironton, Ironton inspires us to keep exploring. We'll continue to map Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the research will ultimately lead to even more discoveries about the Great Lakes and the unique collection of shipwrecks that rest on the lake bed. Thunder Bay is in Canada, but do people live on Thunder Bay? Because I would just literally never, I would that would never get old. I'd be like, where are you moving to? Thunder Bay! Thunder Bay is in Ontario, Canada. Thunder Bay. I'm never, I'm never not going to say it that way. <laughs> I will, I will rip through my vocal cords for the joy of consistently referring to it as Thunder Bay. <laughs> um, it's not that exciting a town. Um, Kareen, with a name like Thunder Bay, that is the excitement. That is the joy. Um, and I, I, it's, there's. Punkin Holler says that there's another um, Thunder Bay in Alaska. I mean, we need to create a union of Thunder Bays. <laughs> I'm five. Um, next story is one I'm really loving. We have a group of really impressive women, female philanthropists, free, nope, female philanthropists who have donated $55 million dollars to create a new Smithsonian Women's History Museum. Uh, it's likely to be a decade off, we're told, but it's, their efforts to establish a home for it have now received this major boost in the, the manner of $55 million, which is a fair old chunkaroo of change. This, we have Tory Birch and Alice Walton are being involved, and they are members of this museum's 23-person advisory board, which also includes actors Rosario Dawson and Linda Carter, tennis legend Billy Jane King, and Craigslist founder Craig Newmark. They want to draw on the 157 million objects in the existing Smithsonian collection, as well as new donations to tell the story of women's contributions throughout US history to the sciences, politics, sport, music, art, cinema, and more. Quote, we have a job to build a museum that's going to serve the public for a very, very long time. Um, from the DNA of this museum, there has been a desire to be inclusive. That sounds pretty cool. And uh, considering my feelings about our very own East End Women's Museum, which we were promised and then was the now fortunately i believe short-lived jack the ripper museum but now there is a real east Women's museum i am very much in favor of trying to i mean i've got a decade i've got a decade to save my money but i want to be there for the opening of this i want to be there isn't it um margaret i've just seen that comment thunder bay is absolutely not a new drinking prompt i do not endorses messages but if i uh if i was ever to start a metal band best believe it would now be called thunder bay <laughs> okay i'm so immature um we have uh an update or a reform on how the treasure act works over here and one of the things that's changing is the definition of treasure is being expanded uh, and it's going to it's going to have a, an inc include significance in the first major reform to the Treasure Act of 1996. This act has always enforced a need to give the finders a legal obligation to report finds that meet certain criteria, in order to ensure that they are offered to museums for public benefit rather than sold privately. Currently, the definition is that newly discovered archaeological finds can only be legally classified as treasure if they are more than 300 years old, made partly or wholly of precious metals, 
or are part of a trove of valuable objects or artefacts. There are reforms being put before Parliament this week. Um, the UK government is proposing to recognise archaeological finds that are relevant beyond their material composition. These changes will apply in England, Wales and Northern Ireland because they are um, clearly very keen, the British government, to ensure that any artefacts on British soil aren't allowed to leave. They recognise that as being important. This will include rare objects, those who provide a special insight into a particular person or event, or those that can shed new light on important regional histories. Discoveries of treasure meeting this new criteria will be... Oh, hello. It started jumping up now on, this, on the... Well, there we go. I'm sorry, the comments coming back on my laptop. How peculiar. I'm going to keep this up. We are Thunder Bay! Correct. Um, <laughs> the changes are expected to enable thousands more finds to be secured for the benefit of the public. These reforms were prompted by a number of recent discoveries that fell outside the scope of the Act, including the Roman-era Rydale Hoard, which is now at the York Museum, the Beerus Britannicus copper alloy figurine, now at the Chelmsford City Museum. Um, these artefacts obviously have been successfully brought into public ownership through other mechanisms but this new definition will make it easier for museums to acquire similar objects in future. An updated code of practice will acknowledge the fundamental role of the portable antiquity scheme in the operation of the Treasure Act and it's also due to be laid in Parliament this week. If the reforms are passed by Parliament they will come into force four months after signing. We are changing the law so that more artefacts and covered by archaeologists and members of the public can go on display in museums rather than ending up in private hands. This will make sure they can be studied, admired and enjoyed by future generations. It's very important that that's allowed to happen. I agree. Michael Lewis, head of the Portable Antiquities and Treasure at the British Museum, said, quote, the British Museum welcomes the extension of the Treasure Act to ensure museums across the country have the opportunity to acquire more finds of archaeological significance. I'm being shady. I mean, I fully agree with this, but it, it's, it's, it's more than a soupçon of hypocrisy, I think. Um, Kath Davis, Director of Collections at uh, and and Research at, oh, this is a Welsh word and I don't want to say it, it's Cymraeg, um, so I don't want to mispronounce that. Amgofeda said, and I apologise if I've butchered that, I'm, I don't speak Cymraeg, uh, said, quote, we are pleased that through this proposed new treasure definition, a greater number of archaeological finds of the highest significance for Wales may be declared treasure each year. This means that more treasure may, may be acquired by local museums across Wales for people to see and enjoy in their own communities. That is very important, very important that things are able to be enjoyed in their own communities. Um, of course, people have fallen foul of the existing act. In December 2022, a 31-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of theft after a Roman hoard reported under the Portable Antiquity Scheme and other valuable fines were found to be missing from a secure facility run by the Lancashire County Museum Service. We talked about that. This man has been bailed pending further inquiries. We also pointed out that the COVID situation has created significant backlog in treasure finds to be processed. Imagine being able to see your own history in your own community. It's almost like it's really valuable for feeling connected to your national identity, isn't it? Um, it is almost like the British Museum sees a value in domestic finds being shown to a domestic audience. Weird that, isn't it? I, I rolled so far, I think I saw brainstem. Um, I've interesting thoughts on this. This uh Val Valparaiso University in Indiana has a Georgia O'Keefe that's worth millions. Um, they want to sell it because they say, for example, their dorms need updating. This is a Lutheran University in northwest Indiana, and it's struggling with declining enrollment. And so it's planning to sell several works from its collection, uh, 
which is in the Brower Museum of Art, they want to raise $10 million to renovate two freshman dorms, which they see as key to securing the future. This announcement, I think fairly understandably, is causing quite a bit of consternation and frankly rage in many arts organisations. And it's also divided the university. The faculty are having a bun fight, it sounds. Um, here are some of the paintings. The, up the top is the O'Keefe. The paintings at the centre of this debate are still on display uh, and it's hoped that they might remain a permanent fixture. He, the the um, individual, so this is Ruff, who is, I think, one of the faculty, I believe. Um, he's an English professor for 33 years, so he hoped they would remain a permanent fixture for anyone to view. He was on site helping to install the, quote, Celebrating Black Artists exhibition in January, when several well-dressed people with an out-of-town look, what? <laughs> okay, walked into the locked, dimly mit lit museum. Turns out the auction house Sotheby's had stopped by. I definitely want to find out what where the, I, uh, to be honest, I have lost track of what's been happening with the East End Women's Museum. Um, this is the prompt that I need to find out what's going on. I have been knee deep in lots of work and it's about time that I check out what's going on there. In terms of updating dorms, um, I, look, when I first went to university, I lived in a set of dorms that have now been removed from the site. We There were 12 of us sharing a kitchen. It was vile. vile. When they were showing pros prospective students around, they asked us to close our front door so that they wouldn't smell us. <laughs> we had, I'm not joking, not mould, we had full-blown mushrooms growing in our shower. So I can see... And, and I, I, I also think that there, there probably was allegedly asbestos in the walls. Uh, I don't know what out of town look means. Um, it, it's connected to being well dressed. What is what is the general attire of people at Valparaiso University? Um, is this is a suit confusing for them? I'm not sure. I don't know. We are now going from, oh, hang on a second. Will the Treasure Act stop the repatriations that have been happening over the last few years? Um, I don't think in its current form, because the Museums Act does that. The Treasures Act would stop things that have been excavated in the countries that are covered by it um, from being either sold into private collections domestically or sold overseas. I mean, that being said, if things have been found that weren't covered by Portable Antiquities or the Treasure Act previously that were being sold out of country, frequently an MP will step in and put a hold on it in an attempt to get to give a domestic museum a chance to buy it. So that's I think it probably won't affect repatriation, but it might it will affect things being that we might ask to repatriate later if that makes some sense so that is what i have in terms of new news let us skiddly dupe that's a made-up word we'll go with it skiddly dupe into our events and exhibitions we are final calling it for treason at the national archives here in london in london in q um this is running until the 6th of april so get it while it's hot get your treason while it's hot um also running we'll be finishing up soon is the uh, executions exhibition at the museum of london docklands so you can double team it nope not that term you can pack your day with two events you can do treason in the morning an execution in the afternoon or maybe you flip reverse it and do an execution followed by a treason Whatever floats your boat. Um, we have this cool thing. This is at Leighton House. I was very kindly invited to go and check out Leighton House when it reopened. And this exhibition looks beautiful. Leighton House itself is utterly beautiful. Um, really worth checking out if you are in London. These are the Even de Morgan gold drawings. And that's going to be on display from the 11th of March. It's already open until the 27th of August. 
um, I recommend taking a trip to this. I think it's free entry if you purchase a ticket to go into Leighton House. You can buy a double ticket and go and check out Sanborn House. This is part of the artist circle that emerged, all of these fabulous houses. So the house is beautiful. This exhibition looks cool too. Recommend checking out both. The Charles Dickens Museum, which is open, as it's, you can see here, Wednesday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., is doing an exhibition that opens this month, 29th of March, goes to the 22nd of October, on Great and Dirty City, Dickens and the London Fog. So this is... We're talking, there's a lot of chat about what an out of town or a city look is. I'm fascinated by it. I'm loving checking it out in the comments. So this seems to be images uh, connected to the text of Dickens. It's about evoking and exploring what Dickens's London was like, what the Industrial Revolution. And in many ways, it connects what we were talking about last week, where there was that news about the analysis done on painting and that perhaps that shift in painting wasn't merely fashion or trend, that it was actually responding to increasing air pollution. So it um, looks very interesting. Now, th this is uh, a site in northern Burgundy in France. I believe that's going to be pronounced Guédelon. And what they are doing is they are building a castle from scratch. They've got 40 master builders uh, and they are building a castle with technology and materials from the Middle Ages. This is going to, this site is reopening on the 1st of April and it's going to be open until the 5th of November. They have a whole bunch of activities and people on site doing traditional craft work. It seems that this stuff happening every weekend and through the holidays, school holidays, even more stuff. Really worth checking out. Also worth um, pointing out is that for all of these exhibitions, except in fact for Guedelon, I have linked the accessibility information where available. I couldn't find it for this castle build, but where it talks, the essentially all of the web pages where it talks about wheelchair access, hearing loops, all of that good stuff. Um, and also if you're unsure, has the contact information, that's my tummy rumbling, it has the contact information for the person to get in touch with if you have further questions. That is all linked in the description box and also on the upper pin board next to the information about these events and exhibitions. This is in Norwich, the Sainsbury Centre. There is an exhibition opening yesterday and running until the 30th of July. So not a massively long one. Uh, Empowering Art, Indigenous Creativity and Activism from North America's Northwest Coast. So looks like it's got some very beautiful stuff. Um, have I not eaten yet? It is super late our time. I, yeah, I'm bad for this. It is. It's it's coming up to 20 past 10. I've not had my dinner. Uh, I just, I, li I live uh, an odd <laughs> semi-nocturnal life <laughs> and my husband is very patient. Is, is this the case? There was a documentary series made there. I did not know. Oh, fascinating. Um, any chance you could email me? Oh, has it got videos on YouTube for the rebuild? Well, then I will. After this, I will go and have a look at uh, those. Is it supposed to be done? It, not on the website. <laughs> it ain't saying it's done. Maybe they're building extra bits. I don't know. It, it was it was very much presented as um, it's there's still stuff to watch in terms of the build. Um, I will once I'm done here i will go and find their youtube and i will link it in the places thank you very much for that oh that's my tummy really going right fortunately we have our last but friends by no means least <clears throat> right, do you know what we're going to remove my comment Just from, there you go, full screen, full screen. The Kanamara Penis Festival, what else could we possibly end with? This is a, a festival 
that celebrates the phallus in Kawasaki. And and why not? And guess what, friends? It is on Sunday, April the 2nd, 2023. And this, my pals, is all day long. It is from 10.15 in the morning to 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Entry is free. Waka, waka, waka. I, it's, and there, and if you go on, if you go on the linked website, this is not the only picture. You can see, in fact, just down by the side of it, the bigger image with <laughs> the little image, there are a collection of people, including individuals who are riding a phallus like a cannon. Um, this, this, friends, is, I think for me, I, I loved our little, um, pendant phallus dude but this guy this guy is 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 my willy of the week i'm i <laughs> clicked on this video and got slapped in the face figuratively by a giant dog happy monday <laughs> welcome <laughs> is, you you've come in right at the end and you've been presented with a large tumescent phallus this is what you get this is the classy production that we're running here at reading the past <laughs> Um, <laughs> Willie of the Week Historical site or historical site I mean, y your your name or mine This, um, I'm not sure the how long or what legacy this Phallus Festival has But I think it is fabulous um, And frankly, why not? Why not have have willies going through the street on a float? Excellent times. Well, friends, um, I'm I have no doubt there'll be there'll be more more willies next week, <laughs> and other historical news that will make me um, <laughs> control myself a little bit better. Um, <laughs> next week we'll meet up at Phallus Fest. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> let's let's keep let's put it in the diary. Let's figure out what we're going to do. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Um, oh, actually, yeah, historical site or hysterical site. Beautiful, chef's kiss. Love it. Um, we could also, of course, meet up at Thunder Bay. <laughs> right, pals, friends, readers. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I'm going to go and have my dinner now. Um, in the meantime, it is always a joy that you take the time to come down here. Please do. Let's pop some historical emojis in the chat or as we call them, social glyphs. What shall we do today? We can't do aubergines or eggplants because YouTube doesn't like it. Um, so if I ask you to do a whole fleet of eggplants it blocks them so whatever social glyph you want to whack in uh i would love it uh, maybe some peaches that can be a little bit saucy um let's put some peaches in and uh also make sure you have liked this video that you're subscribed to the channel and that you click the bell icon i do go live most mondays i'm planning that's for the the planned date there was a chance that we might go live tomorrow for this one but as it worked out it all came in at a perfect timing today. So I was able to be here. So um, it's worth being subscribed and also clicking the bell so that allegedly YouTube will tell you when I am putting out a video or indeed going live. So you can join in with the live chat here or and or when the pre-recorded videos go up on a Friday, you can join in with the premieres there as part of a chat that I am in too. And we will, of course, be having a video on Friday. I hope to see a lot of you in the premiere. I hope whatever time of Monday it is for you, or if you're watching on the playback, wherever you are in your week, that you are having a lovely day and a lovely week. And I very much look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. But for now, do take care of yourselves. Hope you have a great week. <laughs>